folks. This review here has been a long time coming. It's been roughly five years since I reviewed Donkey Kong Country 1, and I'm surprised at myself for not reviewing one of the sequels. In my opinion, the old school DKC games got better with each installment until eventually culminating into the masterpiece that was Donkey Kong 64. Shasta and I are very ready and eager to jump into this game, but before we do, some history needs to be shared. The devs at Rare, I think, had some foresight because they began production on Donkey Kong Country 2 in mere days after Donkey Kong Country 1's release. Yeah, they pretty much knew that DKC1 was going to be such a hit that it would totally warrant a sequel. All the people that worked on the previous title got back together, too. In particular was lead designer Greg Malus whom, besides working on this and the first DKC game, would eventually go on to be the lead designer for other great Rare titles such as Banjo-Kazooie and Grabbed by the Ghoulies. Because Malus had a passion for pirates, the sequel would be designed around a buccaneer theme rather than a jungle. Another developer that returned for Donkey Kong Country 2 was music composer David Wise. That, in my opinion, was a good call because Wise did a hell of a job with the music in DKC1. One more dev that returned as a creative consultant was Shigeru Miyamoto, and whilst Nintendo themselves decided to take a proverbial back seat this time around, Miyamoto stayed to help with character creation and even a few level designs. One of the major things the developers did was to make the new Donkey Kong game more challenging. This was in response to the fans who insisted that they wanted something more demanding than what they previously played. Another big thing the creators did was to make DKC2's levels less linear. Finally, in the Christmas season of 1995, Donkey Kong Country 2 was released in North America, and it garnered huge critical and commercial admiration. Everyone loved this title. Hell, it was so successful, Rare considered porting it to the Virtual Boy. Unfortunately, that never happened. However, it was ported years later to the Game Boy Advance, so that was cool. The general fan consensus on Donkey Kong Country 2 was that it was a better experience than its predecessor. I completely agree with that, too. A good example is DKC2's narrative. Spoiler warning. The plot is as follows. About a year has passed since the events of the first game, and Donkey Kong is relaxing on the beach enjoying a banana milkshake. However, the bad guy from last time, King K. Rule, now going under the moniker Captain K. Rule, has reorganized his forces and sends them out to kidnap Donkey Kong. They succeed in doing such and leave behind a ransom note. Captain K. Rule and his Kremlings demand that the Kongs hand over all their bananas or they'll never see Donkey again. Fortunately, Diddy, along with his girlfriend and newcomer Dixie, take it upon themselves to bring the fight directly to K. Rule's turf on Crocodile Isle. There, the two explore the many varied areas of the island, such as a Spanish galleon, a volcanic cave, a swamp, a theme park, and even a spooky ghost town and a castle. After battling their way through countless waves of Kremlings and other baddies, Diddy and Dixie finally make it to K. Rule's lair. Their fight with him is fierce, but they do eventually win, and Donkey Kong uppercuts K. Rule into the ocean. This is not entirely the end of the story, though. Despite his defeat, K. Rule escapes and relocates to the super-secret Lost World area. But by good luck, Diddy and Dixie have found all the Krem coins and follow K. Rule through the toughest levels of the game. After that, the three engage in one last fight, only for K. Rule to lose once more, and the Kongs watch as Crocodile Isle sinks into the ocean. I gotta say, the plot for Donkey Kong Country 2 is pretty damn good. I mean, it's not earth-shatteringly good, but it is a step up from what was given in DKC1, where in that, Donkey and Diddy were just going after K. Rule because he took some of their food. Anyway, one of the highlights of this game is the introduction of Dixie Kong. The idea and creation of Dixie came from Greg Malus and Shigeru Miyamoto, 
whom during the production decided that they wanted players to be surprised. I'll be completely honest with you folks. I actually prefer playing as Dixie rather than Diddy. Don't get me wrong, Diddy is still a neat character, but Dixie has one crucial thing that sets her apart, and that's her gliding ability. This in particular makes traversing some of these levels much easier. The one drawback Dixie has is the fact that she's not very fast. If you want more speed, Diddy is the guy you'll want to play as. I should note that whilst Rare were the ones behind the DK franchise's development, they kept the tradition of introducing new characters with each installment. No wonder the Donkey Kong cartoon had OCs of its own. Yes, I am a thoughtful son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, we'll review that show soon enough. If you guys are as much into collect-a-thons as I am, then you're in for one hell of a ride. Let's face it, you didn't get much of a reward for getting all there was to collect in the previous Donkey Kong game. However, this time around, you're given a bigger incentive to find it all and master the title. In fact, it's required for you to find all the Krem Coins if you want to get to the Lost World. The Krem Coins are hidden in bonus stages scattered throughout all the levels of Crocodile Island. Most of the time, there are only two bonus stages but a level can have as few as one and as many as three stages total. That means that you gotta take your time and explore these places instead of trying to rush through them. And since DKC2 doesn't have a time limit, you're encouraged even more to check every nook and cranny that you can. Another collectible you'll want to nab are the DK emblems. Like the Krem coins, these emblems are hidden throughout each level of the game. Finding them is a bit trickier though, most of the time, they're hidden in secret passages that you wouldn't have thought to take. Again, search high and low for everything, and take your time. That's right, Shasta. And that leads me to the next awesome thing about DKC2, its challenge. Oh sure, the first and second areas you visit aren't too, too difficult, but once you hit Creme Quay, the swamp land, shit starts to get real. There are levels with air currents that you have to use in order to get further, levels with massive amounts of pitfalls and enemies. There are even a few roller coaster levels which, for a new player, might prove to be really intimidating. This game's challenge, though, is one of the things I personally appreciate. I was hella young when I played DKC2 for the first time, and I think it helped me get better as a gamer. I guess you could say it's a nostalgic thing on my end. In saying that, however, I'd be lying if I told y'all that I didn't die a whole bunch while getting footage for this review. In fact, here's a clip show to prove it. So yeah, if you're a newbie to DKC2, know right now that you're going to die quite a bit. Correct again, my four-legged friend. And speaking of levels, I really dig how these ones were designed. DKC1's levels were quite good, but they were also quite linear. The levels here, on the other hand, are a bit more complex and they're longer. Take these briar patch stages, for example. There are branching paths almost everywhere, and you have to pick the right one or you'll end up at a dead end. Another good example are these beehive levels. Not as many branching paths as the briar patch stages, but they are loaded with enemies. These are the levels that you need to be extra patient with, because more than likely, there's a baddie off-screen waiting to kill you. In all, there are 39 levels in this game, 47 if you count the boss levels. 
Because this game's stages are lengthier and more intricate than its predecessors, you'll spend upwards of about five and a half hours playing it. That's yet another notch in DKC2's belt. Its playtime is big. Nevertheless, there is a downside to this title's length. Unless you're a speedrunner or a gaming god, then you'll want to save your progress, especially when you reach the later levels. Saving in this game, however, is kind of a pain in the ass. Each and every time you want to save the game, you have to visit Wrinkly Kong, Cranky Kong's wife and Donkey Kong's grandma, at her school. This would be all fine and good if you didn't have to pay two banana tokens each and every time you want to save. Yeah, kind of forgot to mention, in addition to the creme coins and DK emblems, there are also these banana tokens dispersed throughout the game. But unlike the coins and emblems, the banana tokens are limitless and you can carry up to 99 of them. Wrinkly will let you save for the free the first time in each area, but every other time afterwards you have to pay two tokens. I could excuse this if it weren't for the fact that if you turn the game off and come back to it later, your entire extra 1-ups and banana tokens are gone, meaning you have to go back to a previous stage and stock up again. It almost kinda sorta of feels like a punishment for turning the game off, not to mention you have to basically pay to save. Do you folks remember the Animal Buddies? Well, a few of them make a return, and several new ones are introduced. The animal friends that come back include Rambi the Rhino, Unguard the Swordfish, and Squawks the Parrot. Rambi and Unguard control just like they did in DKC1, but it was Squawks that got a major upgrade. If you recall, Squawks was only in one level from the last game, and he kinda sucked. This time, however, he's awesome to use. For one thing, he can fly himself and the Kongs around, and while his controls do take some getting used to, he's typically fun to play. Another cooler thing Squawks can do is spit out these eggs and kill enemies with them. Or are those bird loogies? I don't know. Anyway, as I mentioned before, there are several new animal friends to help you out. Five, in fact, but only two of them are actually fun. Those two include Rattly the Rattlesnake and Squitter the Spider. Like Squawks, there is a bit of a learning curve when it comes to Ratley's controls, but in the levels in which he's in, he's quite enjoyable. Squitter is by far my favorite animal buddy. He can shoot web at baddies and kill them, and he can make his own platforms with web too. Squitter's also fast, which means you can steamroll through some of his stages, if you wish. The other three animal friends appear the least, and they're very situational. Case in point, Glimmer the Anglerfish, who only shows up in one level. The level in question is also one of my least favorites because it's too damn dark. Another situational animal buddy is Clapper, the seal. He only appears in two levels, and he's used to cool down boiling water and to freeze cold water. I kind of wish you could ride Clapper. I bet he would have been fun to use. Finally, we get to the last animal friend, Quawks. Squawks's less successful and weaker cousin. He can't spit those loogie eggs, and he can only fly the Kongs around for a short period of time. At least he's more fun to play as than Clapper and Glimmer, so there's that. forgot, there's another Kong that was introduced in this game. Well, technically two, but I already mentioned Wrinkly. Also to note, Cranky and Funky return in DKC2, and they both do exactly what they did in the previous title, giving hints and flying the heroes to and from different areas. This new Kong, going by the name of Swanky, is a game show host who offers extra one-ups if you can answer right his trivia questions. I rather like this guy. He makes getting 1-ups and banana tokens less of a chore when you decide to save your game and come back to it another time. Like all great platformers, Donkey Kong Country 2 has some really fun bosses to fight. 
There are six bosses to face, including Crow, Cleaver, Cudgel, King Zing, Creepy Crow, and finally, Captain K. Rule. Now, all these bosses are hella amusing to brawl with, but it's three in particular that I had the most fun fighting. Cleaver is a giant living sword who you face at the end of the second area. I just like the fact that I'm sparring with an animated weapon. That to me is pretty awesome. Cudgel is this gray hulking Kremlin that you fight at the end of the third area. I love this dude. He reminds me of a crocodile version of the Gray Hulk from the Hulk comic books. Plus, he's challenging. I legit lost a few fights with him. Next, we have the big bad boss man himself, Captain K. Rule. Both his battles are where your gamer skills are going to be put to the test. He's quite difficult, and I suggest new players to look up his patterns on YouTube so when you get to him, you'll be able to defeat him. <laughs> The controls in DKC2 feel slightly less stiff than how they felt in DKC1. That's not to say the controls in the previous title were bad, they were in fact good. However, they did feel just a tad rigid. Donkey and Diddy also moved and jumped a bit slower. Here though, the controls are much more responsive. While I was getting footage for this review, I decided to play a bit of Donkey Kong Country 1 on the side just so I could compare its controls with DKC2. The results speak for themselves. Granted, the control scheme is virtually the same other than now you can perform a team-up move by pressing A. Speaking of which, the team-up move is pretty sweet to use and you'll need to use it not only to dispatch particular enemies, but also if you're looking into collecting all the creme coins and DK emblems. <laughs> Fuck yeah, the music in this game is the tits. David Wise is actually among some of my favorite video game music composers, right up there with the likes of Bobby Prince and Koji Kondo. Here's a fun fact, David also did the tunes for the arcade game Narc, and he would later work on the soundtrack for Super Smash Bros. Melee. The music that Mr. Wise produced for DKC2 draws its inspiration mainly from synth pop and new wave, However, there are a few hints of hip-hop and big band thrown in for good measure. These are my favorite songs from the game. Whilst I don't consider the tunes here to be the best in the Super NES Donkey Kong trilogy, I do consider them to be second best. And to those who want to know, DKC3 had the best music in my opinion. Well folks, I think it's time for me to grade Donkey Kong Country 2 now. So I give it an E for excellent. And I can't wait to review Donkey Kong Country 3 and the DKC cartoon for y'all next year. I really enjoyed playing this title. I found it to be just as much of a fulfilling experience as it was when I played it as a kid. Also, believe it or not, this was only my third time playing through and mastering this game. It can be freaking brutal when it wants to be, and it often is, but that's DKC2's charm. And aside from two little hiccups, this title is just more fun than DKC1. I know I compared the two a bunch, but to be frank, I really don't know of any other platformer that's similar to this or any of the SNES Donkey Kong games. In saying that though, I suggest any new players to actually start with DKC1 before they start DKC2. Trust me, you'll want to dive into something more easy before you even attempt Donkey Kong Country 2's challenge. <laughs> Alright, alright folks, 
before Shasta and I hit the trail, I want to fill y'all in on what's coming your way in December. I've been wanting to review these two movies for quite some time. In fact, I wanted to tackle these films since before I ever started on YouTube. These are a couple of the best, worst movies ever conceived by man. And I think some of y'all know what features I'm talking about. Oh yeah, it's time. I'll see you folks in December.